Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on processing in memory systems. Today, we continue talking about real world processing in memory architectures, but in particular, we are going to focus on our experiences doing benchmarking and analyzing workload suitability for the admin PIM architecture. Remember that the admin PIM architecture is based on DDR4 beam modules inside uh, each of the beam modules, there are eight or 16 chips. One rank uh, contains eight chips. And inside each pin chip, there are eight 64 megabyte banks called MRAM banks and eight DRAM processing units or DPUs. So in total, we have 64 DPUs per rank and typically in the most recent generation, 128 DPUs per DIM. Remember as well that the admin based pin system follows the accelerator model where the Theme, DIMMs are considered an accelerator. And there is a host processor uh, in, the, in this slide, it's called the system on a chip that first loads data to be processed to the DRAM memory banks, to the MRAM banks. Then it transmits a data processing command to the DPUs. And while the DPUs are processing, the host keeps polling the um, PIM side in order to check whether uh, the, the data processing is complete. At that time, the memory bank becomes again accessible to the host processor for it to retrieve the results of the computation on the DRAM processors on the DPUs. <clears throat> in our previous slide, in our previous um, uh, lecture, we talk about uh, app programming the admin PIM architecture, and we mentioned vector, vector addition as our first programming example. In general, and this is uh, the general approach uh, for uh, any workload on the admin based pin system, but also in other uh, parallel systems is to partition the workload, the inputs evenly across the different workers. In this case, the DPUs and the tasklets that are, are the software threads running on the DPU. Uh, you might remember as well that we talk about some general programming recommendations. Uh, the first of them is to execute on the DPUs portions of parallel code that are as long as possible. The second one is to split the workload into independent data blocks, which the DPUs operate on independently. This is, if, if, if it's possible, is uh, is uh, totally desirable because we are want to avoid the communication between DPUs, given the fact that this communication needs to happen uh, through the host processor. The third of the recommendation is to use as many DPUs in the system as possible. So if we have enough computation for all the DPUs of the system, let's use them because this way we maximize the parallelism and the performance, the overall performance will be higher. And the last recommendation is to launch at least 11 tasklets or software threads per DPU. This is um, something that it's based on the uh, the depth of the pipeline, the number of pipeline stages, uh, in order uh, for us to be able to fill all the pipeline stages, we need to use at least uh, 11 tasklets. We already did uh, some analysis on the arithmetic throughput of the DPU pipeline in, um, uh, in our work, and we explained that in a previous lecture, and we observed that indeed the uh, saturation point of the arithmetic throughput <clears throat> happens at 11 tasklets. But these are, are just some general programming recommendations for, let's say, um, um, in-depth uh, support. Uh, I would refer everyone to check the um, admin SDK documentation. You can find the link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the work or most of the uh, uh, contents of today's lecture are based on or uh, past work, benchmarking a new paradigm, and experimental analysis of a real processing in memory architecture. At the bottom of the slide, you can find the link to the long archive version of this work, and also a link to the repository with the uh, uh, source codes. So in this work, we did uh, uh, some significant um, characterization work and uh, workload suitability analysis, and that's what we are going to cover today. We are going to start with the benchmark selection and the diversity of the benchmarks that we selected to create the prim benchmark suite. The goal of creating this prim benchmark suite is to have a common set of workloads that can be used to evaluate the admin beam architecture, compare 
uh, software improvements and compilers and compare future PIM architectures and hardware. And we have two main selection criteria. The first one is to have workloads from different application domains. The second one <clears throat> is to have memory bound workloads on process uncertainty architectures. In total, there are 14 different workloads and 16 different benchmarks. Uh, you can take a look in this slide at the different application domains. We have workloads from dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, databases, graph processing, neural networks, bioinformatics, image processing, and also parallel primitives like uh, reduction or prefix sum that we explained uh, briefly in the previous lecture. Uh, all these workloads, the 14 different workloads, we run them on an Intel CPU and we generated the roofline model for them. So one thing that we observe is that all these 14 workloads fall in the memory bound area of the roofline model. So this is the reason why we believe that these workloads are potentially suitable for processing in memory. Now, what we are going to analyze today is whether they are also potentially, they are also suitable for the admin PIM architecture. The workloads that we chose are diverse as well, not only in terms of domains, but also in terms of computing characteristics, like for example, the memory access pattern, the operate operations and data types, and the communication and synchronization needs. In that sense, uh, there are different um, communication and synchronization patterns that uh, we explore and uh, in terms of inter-DPU communication, some of the workloads are simply merging results on the host. That's the case of Select, Unique, uh, the two versions of histogram and the reduction uh, um, benchmark. They only require DPU to CPU transfers and then the final reduction, the final result merging happens uh, on the CPU side. And then <clears throat> we have other workloads like BFS, MLP, Niedelman Bunch, or the two versions of the um, a scan operation where we have some redistribution of intermediate results. And this redistribution involves CPU, DPU, sorry, DPU, CPU first, and then CPU, DPU uh, data transfers. Let's take a look at the evaluation of the PRIM benchmarks. Um, in our evaluation for uh, our evaluation methodology, we evaluate the 16 PRIM benchmarks from two admin based PIN systems. We will focus more today on the larger one with more than 2,500 uh, DPUs, and we perform a strong and weak scaling experiments on this one. A strong scaling refers to how the execution time of a program solving a particular problem varies with the number of processes processors for a fixed problem size, while weak scaling refers to how the execution time of a program solving a particular problem varies with the number of processors for a fixed problem size per processor. So that's basically the, um, uh, the definition of both strong scaling and weak scaling. We did strong scaling experiments on one DPU using different number of tasklets or pin threads. Uh, one uh, in one rank we use uh, we we perform a strong and weak scaling experiments and in up to 32 ranks we perform uh, a strong scaling experiments. We also have a comparison to um, CPU and GPU and Intel Xeon CPU and an Nvidia Titan 5 GPU. I'm going to show you first some results for the strong scaling on one GPU. Um, here we set the number of tasklets. Uh, to 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. And in uh, our results, we show the uh, breakdown of execution time. This is, for example, for vector addition. In this breakdown, we show the DPU time, that's the, the, the execution time of the DPU kernel on the uh, DPU. We also show inter-DPU synchronization time in case that there is inter-DPU synchronization. That's not the case when you have a single DPU. We show also the CPU to DPU transfer time and the DPU to CPU transfer time. And finally, the speed up over one tasklet. This is the speed up of the DPU kernel execution. As we can see in um, VA, for example, we can observe that it scales linearly until 8, and then for 16, uh, the um, speed up is around 11 which is what makes sense because the performance of the DPU saturates at 11 tasklets. So after 11 tasklets, we don't really have uh, any performance improvement or reduction, reduction of the execution time. We can take a look at uh, some of the more detailed results here. 
for example, for all these benchmarks, uh, what we observe is that the best performing number of task lets is 16. And as I uh, just uh, explained for VA, we see that the um, speed up scales linearly when we increase the number of task lets from one to eight, uh, but the speed up then gets, uh, this is not linear scaling from eight to 16 task lets because the pipeline throughput saturates at 11 task lets. So the key observation is that the number of task lets greater than 11 is a good choice for more real world workloads that we tested. And the reason is that they, this keeps the uh, pipeline fully utilized. <clears throat> One other observation is that for these different workloads like VA, GMB, SPMB, um, binary search, time series, uh, um, uh, multi-layer perceptron, and one of the version of, uh, versions of the histogram calculation, they do not use uh, intra-DPU synchronization primitives, so no uh, overhead from them because that they, they are not using intra-DPU synchronization primitives. Other uh, workloads, other benchmarks that use synchronization, uh, they also don't suffer from the overhead of the uh, synchronization primitives because the synchronization is pretty lightweight. But in other cases, BFS, one version of the histogram, and uh, one of the steps in the transposition uh, benchmark, they use mutexes, and this causes contention when accessing shared data structures. For example, for the long version of the histogram here, we have a single histogram per DPU. So what that means is that uh, before updating one histogram beam, uh, one task led needs to acquire a mutex and then go along to the critical section. And that uh, contention, that use of the mutexes, makes that the best performing number of task lets is not 16 in this case, but it's eight. So in general, <clears throat> intensive use of intra-DPU synchronization across task lets may limit the scalability. And this is what we observe in the um, uh, histogram long um, benchmark. Now let's take a quick look at <clears throat> at all results, uh, strong scaling results uh, on one rank. One thing that we can observe is that for most of the benchmarks, uh, the performance scales linearly with the number of DPUs. Uh, scaling is sublinear uh, only for BFS and for uh, Niederman Bush. In case of BFS, it's due to the load imbalance um, because of the regular graph topology. In the case of Niederman Bush, uh, the reason is that. Um, uh, the, in Niedelman Bush, we are computing a two-dimensional matrix that we are uh, dividing it into multiple anti-diagonals, and the size of the anti-diagonal doesn't increase because we are using more DPUs. So for those anti-diagonals that are short, we cannot use all the DPUs that uh, we can use for the longer diagonals. And that's basically what is uh, limiting the scalability. In our paper, you can check the appendix um, there. We did the same analysis just for the uh, uh, deep, uh, the, the diagonal right in the middle. That is the longest one. And there, for one single diagonal, we can see how performance scales linearly when we increase the number of DPUs. Uh, and for, to show you some results for up to 32 ranks, 2048 uh, DPUs, um, what we observe is that, again, for most of the benchmarks, uh, performance scales linearly with the number of DPUs. Uh, it's only SPMB, BFS, and Middleman Bunch, where there is no um, linear scaling due to load imbalance. Uh, load imbalance across DPUs ensures linear reduction of the execution time spent on the DPUs for a given problem size when all available DPUs are used. That's what we observe for most of the workloads. Um, for three of the benchmarks, there is no um, load balancing. So that's why we don't see, uh, let's say, linear reductions of the execution time when increasing the number of DPUs. We also compared to CPU and GPU, as I mentioned, an Intel Xeon CPU and an NVIDIA Titan 5 GPU. We use um, a state-of-the-art CPU and GPU counterparts, and <clears throat> they are also available in our repository. And one important uh, um, thing, one important note to make here is that uh, we use the largest data set that we can fit in the GPU memory. This means that we are not taking advantage of the fact that the um, processing in memory system can have a larger memory, and indeed that the um, as the memory capacity scales, the 
compute power of the PIM system also increases because the larger the memory, it's likely that the, the higher the number of PIM cores. In this case, we are just using data sets that fit um, inside the GPU memory because we wanted to have, a, let's say, relatively fair comparison in that sense. If you use a larger data set, the GPU will need to oversubscribe. That will uh, require uh, page swaps if we are using unified memory on the GPU, or would require to perform the computation in multiple uh, stages with uh, uh, success successive data transfers between the CPU and the GPU. In these uh, experimental results that I'm going to show you, we show the overall execution time, including DPU kernel time and inter-DPU communication. And uh, for um, performance comparison, uh, on, uh, as you can see, it, uh, we are showing uh, speed up over the CPU, and we have uh, divided the uh, 16 uh, PIM benchmarks in more PIM suitable workloads and less PIM suitable workloads, as you can see. One thing that we observe for these more PIM suitable workloads is that the larger admin based PIM system outperforms the GPU for 10 of the PIM benchmarks with an average of 2.54 times. And even the smaller uh, admin based PIN system with only 640 GPUs has a performance uh, within 65% of the performance of the GPU for these 10 print benchmarks. And these 10 print benchmarks have three key characteristics. The first one is that they use streaming memory accesses. The second one is that there is no or little inter-DPU synchronization. The third one is there is, there is no or little use of integral multiplication, integral division, or floating point operations, because these ones are not natively supported by the um, a current uh, generation of DPUs. And um, if one workload has these three key characteristics, we can consider it potentially suitable uh, to the admin PIM architecture. Some key takeaways to start uh, concluding this lecture. First of all, this is something that we already explained in a previous lecture. The um, throughput saturation point is pretty low for all types of operations or than data types. So our key takeaway number one is that the admin PIM architecture is fundamentally compute bound. And as a result, the most suitable workloads are memory bound and conventional processor centric systems. But when we port them to the admin PIN system, they will likely be compute bound on the DPUs. And this is something that we have observed as well in more recent work in some analysis of machine learning training workloads that we uh, did and published uh, recently. Um, in particular, these workloads are linear regression, logistic regression, decision tree, and k-means clustering. In all cases, for all different versions that we developed, the uh, performance saturates at 11 or more PIN threads or tasklets. And in the admin PIM architecture, as you already know, this means that the pipeline latency hides the memory latency. And as a result, these kernels are compute bound on the admin PIM architecture. So one key takeaway of that analysis of ML training workloads is that ML workloads that are memory bound due to low arithmetic intensity in CPU and GPU become compute bound when running on PIM. So one recommendation is to maximize the utilization of PIM cores by keeping their pipeline fully busy. That is using always at least 11 tasklets. Um, as I said, this work has been recently published. We just presented it at ISPAS um, 2023. And later um, in this uh, lecture, I'm going to uh, provide a link to a pre-recorded uh, talk uh, of um, yeah, ISPAS 2023. The second key takeaway of our work is that the most well-suited workloads for the app and PIM architecture are those that use no arithmetic operations or use only simple operations, for example, bitwise operations and integral addition and subtraction. And key takeaway number three, the most well-suited workloads for the admin PIM architecture require little or no communication across DPUs or inter-DPU communication. As you can see, these are the key characteristics that we mentioned earlier for the more PIM suitable workloads. As a final um, summary of analysis or for analysis with the PIM benchmark suite, uh, key takeaway number four is that the admin based PIN system cannot perform state of the art CPUs in terms of performance and energy efficiency on most of PIN benchmarks, and they outperform state of the art 
the GPUs on a majority of print benchmarks, in particular 10 out of 16 print benchmarks. And in terms of energy efficiency, uh, what uh, the general observation is that they can provide uh, energy savings with respect to CPUs and GPUs on workloads that they provide performance improvements as well. Um, in comparison to CPU and GPU, we have very similar observations or related observations for the ML training workloads, in particular for decision tree and k-means, we compared them to an Intel Xeon CPU and also an NVIDIA A100 GPU. And uh, one uh, observation is that the speed up of the pin version of decision tree is 27 times uh, over the CPU and 1.34 times uh, over the GPU. And for k-means, it's uh, 2.8 and 3.2 times faster than the CPU and the GPU, respectively. We also uh, run these experiments with a larger data set, the Criteo one terabyte data set. And here we observe that the um, a speed up of the pin version of the decision tree goes um, even higher, 62 and 4.5 times faster than the CPU and the GPU version, respectively. This is because when using a larger data set for decision tree, we can also uh, obtain better performance with a, a higher number of DPUs. And this is what explains that for decision tree, we uh, managed to in further increase the uh, speed ups. Uh, for K means, the speed ups are well, with this Criteo data set are basically the same, uh, the same as uh, for the previous uh, data set, the Higgs boson data set, because in that case, we were already using the maximum number of DPUs to achieve the highest performance. So key takeaway from uh, this work is that ML workloads that require mainly operations natively supported by the PIM architecture, and that's the case of decision tree and K-means clustering that don't use floating point operations or multiplication and division of integers, um, let's say, um, uh, frequently, uh, they can outperform their, their CPU and GPU counterparts. Um, there is a longer version of this lecture with more details about the analysis of the admin-based PIN systems using the PIN benchmarks. Uh, you can find a link in this slide. You can find more details in our long archive version, also in our, our journal version. And um, as I mentioned as well, the source codes are publicly available in our repository. We have continued our analysis of different workloads on the admin uh, PIM architecture. Uh, one uh, interesting work is the analysis of a sparse matrix vector multiplication, uh, where we implemented 25 different versions of SPMB um, for different um, compression formats, different um, synchronization approaches, data partitioning approaches, and we are going to cover in more detail this work in a later lecture of this course. This is a ML training paper that I just uh, mentioned and showed you some results. But if you want to um, listen to the entire ESPAS 2023 talk, it has just been uh, premiered in YouTube. You can find a link at the bottom of the slide. Another type of applications that is pretty suitable for the uh, PIN systems, and in particular for the admin-based PIN systems, is uh, sequence alignment. Uh, in this work, we present AIM, that is a framework uh, for high throughput sequence alignment. Here, we implemented uh, the state-of-the-art classic and also state-of-the-art uh, sequence alignment algorithms like um, Needleman Bunch, uh, Smith Waterman, Genasem, um, and the waveform algorithm. Um, we will likely also have a, a lecture, a, a coming lecture about this um, framework. And also presented at ESPAS, a library for efficient transcendental functions on processing in memory systems, because the um, PIN systems usually have WIMPy processing elements, as that's the case of the DPUs in the admin PIN system. They, not support, they don't support transcendental functions natively, so that's why we uh, implemented and uh, we um, it's, it's it's actually publicly available as well this library that implements transcendental functions and also other hard to calculate functions such as uh, a square root using a, a software approach there is also a talk from ESPAS 2023 available and uh, you can find a link at the bottom of this slide and just to conclude um, mention again that we will continue talking about um, 
use cases uh, of uh, pin systems, different applications supported by uh, that, that are more or less suitable, as we will see, uh, for these real pin systems, SPMB, machine learning training, um, bioinformatics workloads such as sequence, sequence alignment. That's something we will cover in later lectures, as well as um, also our um, um, approach to uh, processing using memory, different architectures and prototypes. For example, the uh, Syndrome framework that is an end-to-end -end framework for bit serial Cindy computing in DRAM. This is all for today. I hope you found the lecture interesting and I hope to see you uh, again in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.